Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of our Facebook Live series of conversations. I'm thrilled to be joined uh, by someone you are all probably familiar with by now. He is Guy Benson, a uh, frequent guest on Fox News, the host of The Guy Benson Show, which is both a radio show and a podcast because it's 2024 and it's a, uh, a great listen, but we are also thrilled um, that for the past year plus, almost a year and a half now, Guy has been a member of the AFP Advisory Council. And so we've been thrilled to have him out to several of our events, have him join us at our office and a variety of different events that we have held. So Guy, thank you for joining us today. Of course, it's great to be here. Thank you. I know you're, uh, you're a busy man. There is a lot going on. Uh, it's been a little bit since we did one of these. I know we're now a few weeks out, but right off the bat, I wanted to get your reaction to the president's State of the Union, both kind of what you thought immediately after, and now that we're a couple of weeks out, there's some new inflation data. What mm -hmm. did you think of, of kind of what he said, how he said it, and kind of what the response was? Yeah, so he actually gave the State of the Union address this year on my birthday. So I gave myself really a wonderful gift, which was not to watch it live. I had Bravo. tickets to a hockey game in New Jersey. I went with a colleague. My team won, go Devils. It was all very fun. And then I went back to the hotel later, read the transcript, watched the clips. And I also was sort of looking through text message groups of different friends before I even read what he said or watched what he said. And it was interesting because before I sort of ingested any of the content, I saw my sort of Trumpy Republican friends, of course, blasting the speech. They hated it. Uh, I also had some of my more maybe traditional moderate isn't the right word, but traditional center-right friends, totally trashing the speech. They hated it. My more apolitical, moderate, independent friends were basically not watching, unsurprisingly. And then my friends on the left, Democrats, more normie Democrats, they were thrilled. They were over the moon. They were tripping over themselves to talk about what a breakthrough, smash success this was for the president. I said, okay, that's interesting. So you've got Center-right people opposing, center-left people insisting that this is really, really big and significant and great for him. So I'll just take a look and see what I think. And unsurprisingly, I'm not a huge fan of the president and his policies. I thought that this was an extremely partisan speech in a way that was inappropriate and in some ways unprecedented. But it was a campaign speech from a man who's desperate. At least at that time, you look at the polling, it wasn't uh, looking great, to put it mildly for him. So they came out swinging the speech writers and, you know, attacking Republicans, attacking the Supreme Court. It was not a presidential speech so much as it was a stump speech, uh, a longer nationally televised stump speech. That's and it was very disjointed. It was sort of all over the place in terms of the flow uh, filled with half truths, tendentious claims and outright lies, in my opinion. Um, you know, a thing here or two that you can support. But uh, this was this was a gloves off battle speech by a president who's in political trouble. He also was racing through the speech, shouting it at high decibels, I think, in an effort to evince energy, because there had been all the discussion about his mental acuity and his energy levels. And is he too old for the job, as the vast majority of Americans across the board believe he is. So he's trying to counter that, whether they pumped him full of something, uh, whether he just had some natural adrenaline, well, the pump and circumstance around that big event in the packed room, I don't know. But he was definitely more agitated than usual. Uh, some people read that as strong and engaged. I read it as kind of shouty and weird. Uh, he was therefore speed reading and slurring words, and he slurs a lot of words anyway. So I kind of said I was disappointed that, you know, President Norms went even further than any predecessor I can recall in terms of the partisan bare knuckle nature of the speech. But I thought it was just kind of more of the same from him in terms of his overall messaging, maybe trying to energize his base that needed a shot in the arm. But I thought it was bad. So um, I tweeted, I tweeted later on that I think that everyone on social media and in my line of work would go out and spend the evening and the next morning analyzing it to death and breaking it down and ultimately would have almost no impact whatsoever. Uh, and I got some interesting pushback, Akash, on that from some of my center left friends. They were saying, <clears throat> normally you're right. Normally State of the Union, it doesn't really matter. 
But this one's different because this one was better than his previous ones, and he really needed a morale boost for the team. Um, and he sort of laid out what the the next eight months are going to look like. And there's a real sense of energy and and rediscovered purpose on the left. So this actually this is going to help him. This one's this is a big deal. I said, all right, we'll see. So let's fast forward. Here we are. We have the benefit of what almost two weeks uh, from from the State of the Union. Almost immediately, I got an inkling that my got my analysis was correct because CNN has polled every year of the Biden presidency, his joint session speech or his State of the Union speech. And already we know that, especially in recent polarized times, the audience skews heavily in favor of the president who's giving the speech, right? Generally, people who are dissatisfied or apathetic or dislike the guy, they're not going to tune in. Usually it's more going to be the fans of the president who tune in and watch. So unsurprisingly, given that fact, in all four years, CNN polling showed that a large majority had a favorable view of the speech. But this year, it was the worst of those four. The, the, the ranking or the rating, favorable, unfavorable in the CNN series, had the worst numbers for Biden of, of any of the speeches he's given so far on that platform. So I was like, okay, maybe not the home run that some of my friends uh, had suggested. And I almost wondered if they were, if this was some group effort at projection where they'd been pummeled with so much bad news, polling economic otherwise for so long that they were like, okay, here's a moment where at least you've got all the Democrats standing up and cheering and the Republicans look unhappy and Biden at least has some fire and some life in him. Let's just say this was great. Are we all saying it's great? Okay. We're saying it's great. And like they were trying to convince themselves of yeah. what it did. And now Two weeks later, I wrote a piece at Town Hall late last week <clears throat> and looking at some of the data just out this week, not only did he not get a polling bounce, uh, in some respects, things have deteriorated further for the president in terms of his polling standing. So uh, I think that my view has been vindicated. This was not a helpful speech to him. Um, it was vastly overrated in terms of its quality and its impact. And I do wonder, you know, if, <clears throat> if I'm in their shoes, the people who were just, you know, through clenched teeth, hissing that it was such a success. Don't you understand? It's different this time. I wonder if there's any self-doubt starting to creep in, any sort of self-reflection within that crew, within the Democratic Party, within the media, because the, the blob, they all were in vigorous agreement with each other about what the upshot of this speech was. And the American people, through now many polls, have indicated that they were wrong. So if they can at least tell themselves with their eyes and ears, this was very good and will help, and then it doesn't help, what does that say either about their judgment in the first place or about Biden's ability to move the needle in a significant way moving forward? Uh, those, I think, are significant questions. Yeah, you know, that, that makes me think that my initial reaction certainly was yours, that it was unprecedented and, and very political. It seemed very odd to give a speech like that with the Supreme Court justices there and the leaders of our military, these, these people that are detached from partisan politics of the day, the whole thing was very uncomfortable. But the way you describe the reaction of people on the left kind of vindicates one of my, my reactions of, or kind of thoughts of what their expectations were, which was to reinvigorate their base. They weren't actually trying to change the hearts and minds of, of swing voters or people who were undecided or may have voted for the president, but now don't approve of him. Their, their own progressive base is not excited about him for a number of reasons. And so if, to the extent that they set out just to accomplish that, I think they did. That, of course, is not a winning strategy from a policy nor a political standpoint, which leads me to my next question. He, some of the, the reactions coming out were that people really approved of the ideas that he rolled out. They really liked what he was saying and things like that. But, my, you know, my reaction to that is, of course, you like the sound of, of free stuff and, and government handouts and things like that on a surface level, right? But if you dig even an inch deep, then it was more spending, more class warfare, more of the same policies that are ultimately going to drive inflation. So even though that may not have come through initially, do you feel like that's something that's going to continue to pay dividends for the president if he hammers those themes? 
in an election year? Or ultimately, was it if there was a bump there, that was it? And as people learn more, they're not going to like it as they haven't liked and, and it. There wasn't, and there wasn't a bump is the other thing. Yeah. And, and you're right. Clearly, this was a base motivating speech. That was the goal. And at least anecdotally, it seemed like some elements of the base did get animated from it. But were there a bunch of young people sitting around on a Thursday night watching the State of the Union and saying, you know what, let me give this 81 year old man another shot. Maybe he's better than I thought. I mean, you look at the reaction of the the Hamas supporter, Hamas sympathizer crowd in the Democratic base. They've been yelling louder than ever, snubbing Biden overtures to reach out to them and pander to them. I just don't think it has ha had any sort of lasting a positive impact. As for this agenda that he laid out, I mean, a lot of it's just like scattershot, right? And this this isn't just Biden, in fairness. This is presidents get up there and they just unroll this laundry list of things that they want to do. Aspirations, programs, proposals, often they're very unrealistic, policy-wise, politically, what have you. I think part of the problem that Biden has is he's no longer running for re-election by definition as a, hey, Let's turn the page from the previous guy, and I've got all these good things I can do next. He's now had close to four years to implement his agenda. And the White House keeps saying, this is one of Corrine Jean-Pierre's favorite lines to read from the binder that someone's written for her, that he has done more in three years than most presidents achieve in two terms. That's the, that's the line that they've decided to, uh, to embrace. <clears throat> I don't think it's true, first of all, but whatever, it, it's political spin. Um, let's say we take them at their word and they can they can provide some sort of statistical analysis showing that this has been an unprecedented level of productivity from Joe Biden compared to all other presidents. Okay, sure. Uh, fine. If that's the case, look at the president's approval rating overall, overall and then in specific uh, issues and, and issue sets, he is deep underwater on almost all of them. So if he's in fact, achieved and accomplished all this stuff, uh, that's one thing. People don't like it. They're not buying it. They don't want it. And so the idea like, oh, well, you need to give us four more years to do even more of this. I think that's a tougher sell because people aren't satisfied at all with what they've already done in their supposedly uh, historically uh, productive three years. Um, so it's, it's a combination of people doubting his ability to do the job based on just manifest evidence whenever he goes out publicly. And to the extent that the job has been done, they are dissatisfied, too deeply dissatisfied with the outcome. Uh, and that's obviously a very difficult spot to be in politically as an incumbent trying to persuade people to make you president until you're what, like 86 or 87 years old? Obviously, it's, it's a tough sell. Yeah, absolutely. It sort of reminds you of the phrase, not to confuse activity for accomplishment. They've done many things, right? They spent an additional $6 trillion last Congress. And uh, what we have to show for it is prices are up almost 20%. One of the things AFP did, which you talked about on your show, leading into the State of the Union, um, was we actually purchased the domain Bidenomics.com. We've been running a number of campaigns, holding the president, the people that voted for his agenda, accountable. And we'll get to the substance of what's on Bidenomics.com, kind of fact checking the president in a second. When you first saw that it was AFP of all places that owned Bidenomics.com instead of the White House or the Democratic Party, what was your reaction to that? I was honestly genuinely shocked. Like I, I did a double take because I thought that the tweet or I think I might have seen on Instagram, the website must have been something like Bidenomicstruth.com or the real Bidenomics.com or something that was a spin on it. Certainly. Bidenomics.com was not available for someone to just go out and buy, especially a conservative group like AFP. There's no way that the Biden team would be that incompetent, especially a team that's historically done more than any other president ever. Uh, one thing I guess that wasn't on the list was LockdownBidenomics.com. They decided to embrace that phrase for some reason. They decided to tattoo the economy across Joe Biden's forehead. And they knew that Republicans and conservatives and free marketers and everyone uh, take a dim view of Bidenomics and would be more than happy to embrace that same term and stick it to him. So they kind of wanted to try to embrace what was maybe initially a slur and say, like, all right, we own it. But what they didn't own, apparently, was the domain the whole time. Like the URL was for sale until relatively recently. This was just a massive oversight just from a politics standpoint. I have a, dem a couple of friends who are, who are Democrats, I, I referred to a few of them earlier, who are not just like 
vote Democrat, people who work in Democratic politics and are active within the party. So I tweeted uh, about this, just astonishment that you guys had snapped up that website and turned it into an attack site, which is just amazing. And I got texts from like members of Congress, a lot of po political professionals who were just flabbergasted. One of them was one of these aforementioned Democrats who said, this is 101. It's like, I cannot believe they let this happen. I'm like, me neither. And I, I, I heard the backstory with an AFP, like someone just like typed it in one day, Bidenomics.com. And they were like, oh, I, I must have misspelled it. No way is this available. Narrator, it was available. And you guys got it. It's just, it's amazing. And, and hopefully uh, you guys can get a lot of eyeballs on the site because it very much takes the cherry picked spin from Team Biden <clears throat> and, and throws a light on it and really goes through in a fact check, uh, a thorough fact check sort of uh, service, public service <clears throat> to, I think, further undermine the talking points that uh, that we've heard from from the Biden campaign, from the Biden White House. And the thing that's, I think, encouraging, Akash, because it can get frustrating as someone who cares about this stuff and anyone watching this obviously cares about this. When you see them gaslight and make claims and <clears throat> pick very specific statistics that just miss the forest or the trees and it's like almost intentionally deceptive in some cases it can be it can it can bother you right because you're like this is what they're force feeding the country the media is usually on their side so they're getting away with it the positive news is they're not at least for now they are not and have not been getting away with it biden's approval rating on the economy is dreadful it's worse in most cases than his overall approval rating people just feel that the story they're telling isn't reality. It does not comport with their lived experience, which is a term that the left loves so much. And so to add some meat to the bones, to add some stats and some numbers, to just help people fully reconcile their gut feeling with the facts, which is what you guys have done on Bidenomics.com, massive public service, and like an extra twist of the knife that it highlights one of their epic political fails of 2024 at the same time. Yeah, it, it really amazed me. And you, and you and I are both young. We know a lot of people who've worked in the digital space, kind of like do a lot of their, their business online. A White House that prides itself on being very online, having a lot of millennials and Gen Z people uh, to fail to do this kind of digital one-on-one -on -one thing. Yeah, exactly. online in a lot of ways. But <laughs> you'd think that being too online would at least avoid this one. Yeah. Didn't. No, no. And, that, and that's the thing. And, and on the website itself, folks can see on Bidenomics.com, we're not just taking claims from the White House. These are direct quotes from the president about these issues, about inflation and about the deficit and about wage growth and about the labor market and things like that. Taking yeah. his direct quotes and responding to them with the actual facts of what people are dealing with on the ground. And so the last question on the economy, God, we had one more inflation report come out. Inflation has actually ticked up a little bit again. Um, it doesn't seem like there's going to be some massive transformation in the economy between now and the end of the year. There, do you really see any situation in which his economic numbers improve? Or is it that we're now three years into an inflation crisis? And even if they improve, if the economic situation improves a little bit, inflation has just taken such an enormous bite out of people's pockets that that sentiment is kind of baked in. Yeah. I mean, never say never, but the results thus far are, are not optimistic uh, from Biden's perspective. And the problem is you still have the numbers going in the wrong direction, right? They're saying inflation is down. Well, prices aren't down. Prices are still going up. The car is still driving in the wrong direction at a slower speed, but still the wrong direction. People want to go the other way because they can't afford things. Prices are up, what, roughly 18% overall since Biden took office when he just unleashed an orgy of new spending. He had his own advisors, aligned economists like Larry Summers and others saying, well, let's hold off here. Uh, this could get really inflationary. They said, oh, screw that. We're going full speed ahead. Never let a crisis go to waste. Let's spend the money. We've got the votes. Thank God they didn't have the votes to do even more, right? They want to spend trillions yeah. more than they did. They came two votes away from uh, from doing that in the Senate. If you yeah. didn't have two Democrats who are no longer running for election, by the way, Manchin and Cinema, they've been basically drummed out of their own party or they feel like they can't win. So if not for those two votes, it would have been even worse with Biden putting on a lot of pressure for it to be even worse. I think that's important for people to remember. Uh, but they did all this spending and the result was inflation. It was not 
minor. It was not transitory. It was acute and damaging and harmful and painful. And it's still that way. And prices are still really elevated. And overall wages have not caught up. Wages are still, in the scheme of things, depressed because they've been outpaced. Wage growth outpaced by inflation growth. And then when you look at, for example, they put out these big jobs numbers every month. Oh, look at this massive jobs number. And then the next month, they bring it down and they revise it significantly down. They can play whatever games they want. They can spin however they want to spin and say, you ingrates, you don't understand what a great economy this is. People understand how they're living day to day. People can remember all the way back to 2019, for example, and say, you know what? My life was a lot better off then. And you look at what happened, a big crisis in terms of COVID and an international pandemic. Then Biden comes in promising to fix it all, right? Biden just said, I'm not the other guy. I'll get rid of all that drama. I'll get rid of COVID and we'll grow the economy together and I'll be sort of like this normal, stable person. And a lot of Americans said, great, let's go with that. And the results have been uh, disappointing to disastrous. And here we are seven, eight months out from a general election where the man who made all those promises, now I just saw him in a speech this week, he said, this election is not a referendum on me. I'm running against a guy called Trump, right? That is going to be how they try to play this. They're going to try to say, make it a referendum on the challenger, not on the incumbent. They did that successfully in 2020 with all the mail-in balloting and all the weird stuff happening during COVID. It's a different era now. It'll be a little bit different for them to try to, in an audacious way, make it again a re-referendum on the last guy whose results, whether you like him or not, his results on issues, according to all the polls, were significantly better and just basic metrics of success better than Joe Biden's on in key areas. I think, again, that's going to be a heavy lift for them, but they're going to try and they're going to spend a billion dollars over the next half year plus making that case to disqualify their opponent again. And we'll see whether that works. Absolutely. It'll be interesting to see. I want to pivot a little bit to an issue that actually does have enormous bipartisan support, frankly, and that is uh, this issue with TikTok. You've been a tireless advocate for free speech. You're not one clamoring for government to jump on platforms and ban yep. them and things like that. You can tell us briefly, why is this TikTok situation differently different? And why should the government be stepping in here with this bill to force them to divest or ban it? Yeah, it's, it's not a free speech or a First Amendment issue. It's a countering China issue. China is our biggest geopolitical adversary, I'd say almost by far at this point. Most Americans agree with that. And they, through ByteDance, the parent company, exert a lot of control over this company that is broadcasting messages through an algorithm directly to the screens of tens of millions of young Americans every day. And you look at not just like the the data privacy concerns and the data mining and, and all of that, which is a huge espionage tool. It's also, I think, almost worse, a propaganda tool where TikTok in China force feeds those kids, by the way, on a very limited basis. They can only be on TikTok a certain amount of time every day. It's a lot of educational material and reinforcing the party line within China. In the US, it's completely different. A lot of it is very dark. A lot of it uh, is sort of like um, demoralizing intentionally, sowing certain narratives and, and negative seeds about the country. They can put their thumb on the scale, whether it's Israel and Hamas or other issues down the line, uh, China-related issue. There's a reason why China is squealing so loudly about this bill, which is not a TikTok ban. It says, look, TikTok, if you want to stay in the U.S., fine. You have to sever your ties with ByteDance. It cannot be Chinese-owned anymore. And the fact that China is saying, we'll never sell, we will never allow that, I think tells you everything you need to know. It's not about the money. It is way more valuable to the Chinese Communist Party than money because they view it as what it is, an espionage and propaganda tool against a massive portion of the United States population. That is invaluable. That is priceless in terms of information warfare, which is why their response has been what it is. Uh, You said correctly, Akash, I'm a huge free speech guy. Mary Catherine Ham and I wrote the book, End of Discussion, years ago. This is different because the bill is very narrowly tailored. Uh, I'm a big fan of Chairman Gallagher. Um, who who has overseen this process. It is specific to four hostile countries saying, 
we can't, and we have rules about this <clears throat> in terms of media ownership elsewhere. Like you can't go and buy uh, like a news network, for example, in the U.S. as, as a foreign national, uh, even in some cases from a friendly country. But like, oh, we're going to let hostile foreign enemy governments own huge platforms with massive impact inside the United States, just a total free reign and say, well, that's what the First Amendment requires. I don't think that's true at all. So we can keep TikTok. I have no problem. People love TikTok and scrolling and the dances and everything. It's fine. The question is Chinese ownership, CCP ties. And if they're willing to make a huge amount of money and sell that off and all the ties are severed, great. If they're unwilling to take even a premium amount of money for it, I think, again, that underscores the threat and the real purpose of this, which is why it is a national security issue. And I've been gratified in, in spite of some of the squawking from some people. Uh, there seems to be a pretty broad bipartisan consensus for once on something that I think is a measure of national seriousness. Uh, and at least on this test, it's a rarity these days, but on this test, it seems like we're passing it so far, but we'll see what the end game is. Absolutely. AFP was proud to be the first conservative organization to come out and support that bill when it was released a couple of weeks back. And so we are pushing hard to get that through the Senate. The president said it would sign, he would sign it. So we appreciate your thoughts there. I know we're short on time, Guy. Any last words of advice for conservative activists, conservative candidates on how they should be conducting themselves, what they should be emphasizing as we go into the rest of this year and what the path to victory is? I would just say on a national level, saying that the other side is terrible on many, many issues is correct. And saying that the other candidate is unacceptable in many cases, including at the very top, is correct, but it's not necessarily enough, which is what was seen in 2022 in the midterms. That was supposed to go differently than it did. Just saying, well, look, the historical patterns, the polls, whatever, it should be fine. Uh, don't rest on your laurels because there have been a few cautionary tales already. It has to be an active fight to the very end, including making sure people actually vote and use all the tools available to them to get that done and to bank their vote. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you and your partnership with AFP and looking forward to having another conversation again soon. Thanks, Akash. Thanks.